Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here with a look at medieval architecture. This is going to be the last of our videos for the medieval or Middle Ages time period. Uh, this is looking at architecture and changes from the Roman style of architecture and new style that develops during this time period referred to as Gothic architecture. Let's take a little bit of a look here. What do you say? Okay, let's take a first look at some basics of architecture and the idea of what is an arch, which is that simple idea uh, making this rounded opening and you take these arches the Romans were great at doing this the arches they used for building bridges for building uh, aqueducts to bring water uh, marvelous inventions but someone determined later on that if I take a bunch of arches and stack them together I get what's referred to as a barrel vault and I can do several of those and the Romans would use those for things like uh, underground for sewage systems uh, that they had uh, but also above ground as well to carry you know water uh, in uh, the aqueducts but also underground a lot of times that water travel as well if I have two barrel vaults that come together I get a cross or a what is referred to as a groin vault so that's a little bit of a background on arches oh one thing I want to talk about was this idea of a keystone it's this top stone up here in the very top part of it usually it's more a little bit wedge shaped a lot like this one down here the Romanesque architecture this is a style uh, of very thick walls this is not true Roman because we're having a rounded vaulted ceiling as opposed to a flat roof uh, so this is different we are using that very rounded Roman style arch however uh, we have these thick massive columns very thick walls to support the ceilings that are made out of stone as a result there's a sense of darkness inside almost cave-like a little bit of light up here you can see coming in from this arch a little bit here but if it wasn't for a lot of light being uh, brought in Otherwise, there'd be this very big sense of darkness inside this building. Um, later Romanesque architecture, this is the beginning of some of those changes. We're seeing we're trying to get these a little bit more along, get a little bit taller. They're still pretty thick columns and narrower openings, but we're starting to see uh, a more opening than column here, and actually a second row of them here. Again, still this rounded arch on top. It's still very dark, and in fact, if it wasn't for artificial lighting inside here, this would still be very dark making improvements but we got a ways to go mostly because our outside walls are so thick and dark and don't have a lot of windows again example of a ceiling in Romanesque architecture you can see those sort of rounded type of vaults uh, we're trying to put some detail in there to make it seem you know a little more uh, stories in the Bible and a little bit more decorated. Uh, in fact, this one's actually coated in uh, gold leaf to make it look a little bit brighter and to brighten things up and to show the glory of God in there. Uh, but again, even without the lights in here, this is something you could barely see, you know, in, in most times even the brightest part of daytime without some kind of internal lighting. Now, why don't let's take a step back here and look at some Islamic architecture and some adaptations they had made. This is some Islamic architecture, and I'm not sure why this picture is a little leaning to the left here. Um, bad cropping, I guess, on my part. But you can see that our arches here are now have a little bit of a step design here and a little more point at the top. But you look at the openings here, much thinner columns, much more open looking here. Uh, this is the uh, Hagia Sophia here, uh, the massive church uh, originally built and later became a mosque and now it's a museum uh, built in this is in Constantinople uh, today Istanbul this is that style of architecture that is uh, neither sort of Eastern and neither Western sort of a blend of the both okay uh, note the Arabic arches over here and they've got some of those in here but the important reason I point these out to you is because of the influence they will have later in Europe again here's this Islamic architecture still some rounded here we can see some of this sort of pointed arch that reminds you of say maybe a you know Arabian Nights or those types of things and again much more open kind of sitting here but still a lot of columns involved in here but you can see the way they're stacking these arches and then getting to, to come in to brace each other coming down onto a single column um, some changes going on the, the arches instead of being completely round here are starting to be a little bit pointed at the top and the reason I point this out here is because this is the change again as I said is going to influence what's going on in Europe okay so this is Gothic architecture and I've got these two pictures here to kind of show you the high sort of Gothic style very much this Gothic arch with this very much appointed here as you can see 
arch uh, we can see right here. You can see this in the, the groin vaulting and all this stuff that is up here, and the vaulting in the ceiling here, a lot more of that. But also the thing that really identifies Gothic architecture is this over here. We've got these flying buttresses that are supporting these walls. We're taking some of the weight over here from these and then flying it out this way and then down this buttress. And the advantage of that is it's allowing to support things, but allows those inner walls to be made much thinner, a lot more glass, allows for a lot more light, as we can see right here, coming in. Okay, so this earliest version of sort of Gothic architecture comes here at the Royal Abbey of Saint Denis. This is near Paris in France, of course. Uh, this is a very, again, of course, early Gothic style. We can see they've got a rose window here. We're starting to see a little bit in terms of that arch being trying to make things a little bit tall, a little bit more open. We've got a little bit of uh, supports coming here, but not nearly as much as we're going to see later on. This is around AD 1140, and this is the first introduction of the rib vault, which is what we're going to see uh, in the ceilings and that sort of supporting types of things that go on there. Uh, this is again a later case of Gothic architecture. You can see the, the facades becoming much more elaborate with archways and openings and look at all the intricate detail. All this stuff is carved by hand stone. Uh, and the ability to do this is just amazing. You're talking about, you know, the 1100s, the 1200s, the 1300s, and, and later. This is the Gothic architecture here. This is the idea we talk about this, trying to open things up on these thinner walls and these huge windows. Well, these are like walls of light. We've got scenes here and people from the Bible, but also some kings as well. And this is the uh, rose window from Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, Notre Dame in Paris, if you will. Uh, this is the big, of course, the rose window, as it's called, any kind of big circular stained glass window is referred to as a rose window in a cathedral. Uh, this one is 32 feet in diameter. If you're looking at my class, we're not even 20 feet from the front of the board to the back of the room. This is the outside of uh, Notre Dame de Paris, that rose window right here in the center. Uh, we put a sort of spire here in the center. This is a later adaptation. Uh, the two towers here were supposed to continue up and be very very tall but we ran out of time we ran out of money and so that doesn't become a focal point of things to do what is very clear if we were right across here on the, the river Seine what we can see here is the flying buttresses coming off that are supporting these side walls very clear to see these ones on the end to see the structure of this and how these work this is that rib vaulting in the ceiling that's very clearly shown here in this thing here the ceiling is made of these ribs that can take up the the vault and come down and is reported into these various columns but again look at this it's like literally a wall of windows back there uh, but in between the windows this is all carved stone in between all this that holds it all together okay this is the choir and asp the very top end of what would be the the head of the arch or the head of the cross uh, if you look at that cross shape of a basilica type church uh, and this is where the, uh, the cathedral would be this would be where the choir would be um, towards the front or the head of the church. This is the uh, cathedral in Köln, Germany. It's Cologne for those of us Anglophiles, English speakers. Uh, this is the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Built very similar to that sort of style that we see um, with Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, we see, you know, uh, the nave here and the apse across here, and then the head up here. This is where that part we saw all those windows earlier. The two towers back here, these are actually sort of finished. I don't think they were as tall as they originally planned them to be. Uh, in fact, sometimes you will see towers where one tower is taller than the other or finished in a top style, a little bit different from another. Uh, Notre Dame de Paris in Paris actually does that a little bit. Look at the detail, however, on this carving on the entranceway here. Again, this is the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. The glimpse, those aren't ants, those are actual people. This is in Canterbury, England. This is Canterbury Cathedral. This is the cathedral where um, Sir Thomas Becket was, uh, got part of his head knocked off by a couple of uh, Henry II's knights. Um, beautiful uh, Gothic cathedral. Um, I went there on a tour, got to see all the things there, and, and got a nice tour guide uh, as he rushed us through before a big school group came in to show us everything. And you can see exactly where Thomas the Becket was murdered. You can see where he's buried. He's interned there, uh, and lots of famous kings and, and nobles, nobility as well. This is my favorite Gothic cathedral. This is the uh, Munster 
um, Ulm in Ulm, Germany, in uh, Baden-Württemberg. It's actually Ulm is on the border between Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria, the two southern states of Germany. Um, it's my favorite because it, I've been there and seen it several times. So these are drawings of, of it when it's not nearly complete. Uh, in fact, as I recall, this is probably these are drawings, but are probably in you know the 1700s. This is actually a picture of the cathedral, almost that exact same height. You can see here, this is actually a photograph taken in 1887. You can see the height here uh, where we finish it off. Um, they weren't quite finished. They will then extend this up later. And let's take a look at that. Uh, this is a cathedral in its current uh, format. Uh, it's in, again in southern Germany at 161.53 meters. It's the highest church steeple in Europe. Uh, the highest Gothic, Gothic uh, church spire in the world. Uh, that's just shy, I believe, of 530 feet, 529.95. We'll round that up to 530. The laying of the foundation stone of this church was in the year 1377. Interesting note about this was uh, the townspeople of Ulm took up the collection to build their cathedral and decided to build it themselves. Usually the church would say, we would like you to build a cathedral, and then the people would then be responsible for trying to raise the money to do so. In this case, they raised the money, started the building, and then got church permission to do so. Okay, The completion of the building, however, was not completed until 1890. That's right, that's over 300 years to construct the building as we know it today. This is the very top of the finally completed tower. Look at all the amazing detail on here. This is the internal part of the very top of the spire here. You can see some of the support network in there and that same idea of flying buttresses to support stuff in there. And you can see while these are all open up in here, if they were further down, these would have been you know, actual windows. But in this case, this is all closed off. Looks very Harry Potter-esque. Again, uh, some of that detail at the top, again, all this uh, carvings, we've got gargoyles up here, we've got crosses and, and intricate details all up at the top. This is actually a railing here, and a person would be approximately just a, about this high up at this point. This picture I just couldn't resist, this is it at night, obviously around Christmas time, and since that's the same kind of time we are with the snow, it looks awfully beautiful, just had to include this one. Just to give you a sense of the interior, okay, this is the uh, the, the main nave here through here. Uh, then we have the side sections over here. In this case, the priest is set up. This is actually the choir section back over here. This is set up for sort of a concert thing. People are singing. We got the, the band and the music over here. This is one of the places where the priest would generally give his sermon from, but we see the altar set down here. Um, the reason why we elevate them because without application systems back in the medieval time periods, they've got to be heard somehow. I want to show you some of that um, rib vaulting in the ceiling. Look at the detail on the intersections and as my wife pointed out, a beautiful example mathematically of a natural tessellation in action. So if you're wondering what's the application of all that math I'm learning, here it is. This is just an exterior photo to kind of show you the size of people down here. Um, some of these are further back, so they actually look taller than they are in relation to the building itself. But it's just a, a massive, massive building. I incredible. This is the plaza out in front of it. A couple pictures that I took. This is a picture I took of the interior. You can see the pews down this way. There's actually a couple places where, depending on the size of the congregation for a, a, a larger mass, the priests would be up in here. For smaller masses, they move the congregation all towards this other end. And there's a, a smaller one of these pulpits here as well. This is I'm Coming up in the uh, the tall spire uh, on the front, the tall tower. Looking back at the two small ones on the back and over the roof. Not all churches in Europe, however, that way. This is the Frauenkirche, the uh, tallest building in Munich, Germany, or München, if you uh, speak German. This church, known as the spires here, are not that Gothic style. We have some of those types of architecture in here. Uh, we don't see the massive flying buttresses in here. We're doing these a little bit differently. And this type of style that they call a Zwiebel top, uh, an onion top dome, is sort of influenced by the fact that they are closer to the Middle East and and that, that part of Germany. And this is an influence really of that sort of style that develops uh, with the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Church and them influencing then Russia. And this, these guys are closer to that same kind of region. They get that same kind of influence. Over here we can see, however, that sort of a building that has that much more Gothic style. 
That's going to wrap it up for my little tour here of some Gothic architecture. It's not all encompassing, but just some overview. Yeah, a little heavy on uh, the Munster in Ulm. Been there, so that makes it kind of my favorite. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. Oh, 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 oh,